Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. You're all back and it's worthwhile that you're back because now two heavyweights, two world champions are waiting for you. They both come from Rhineland. They both are fathers to families and they both are CEOs of very big, very important international companies. Oliver Bete, he thinks quick, he speaks quick, he runs quick, and he's very well known for his crystal clear approach to reform his big company, the Allianz, worldwide the biggest insurance company. And at the first annual meeting of Allianz, which he shared, he came in with red sneakers. And those of you who know Allianz, this is really a break with tradition. <laughs> And the very last person at Allianz knew at this moment, now it's time for digital transformation. <laughs> And they knew this is not a party, but this is a long distance run. And when I look at you all, and I look at the very strong features of Oliver Bete, and we all would go outside and doing some sport, he would be probably the most promising athlete among us. <laughs> Last year was the most successful year of Allianz, and uh, since he took the helm of Allianz, the wealth of the company increased, uh, the stock value of the company increased by 31 percent. Werner Baumann, Werner, Werner Baumann is the mastermind of the most adventurous, most phenomenal acquisition in history, the purchase of the agrochemical company Monsanto. <laughs> He's uh, at Bayer for 30 years now, since 10 years, he's, uh, for 10 years ago, he became CFO of the company. Four years ago, he became CEO of Bayer. And you can well imagine that those last four years have been the most challenging in his career. The key word is uh, glyphosate. <laughs> Let's welcome and uh, The reception now is hosted by Uwe Janhäuser. He is uh, at the helm of uh, the economic desk of Die Zeit. Now let's welcome three Alpha Tiere. Bevor ich, ah, da ist es. Ja? Also, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, we, I'm here with two leading CEOs in, in the German corporate realm, Oliver Bete, Werner Baumann, and we've decided to, to do this in English today, which gives me the once in a lifetime opportunity to call these two gentlemen by their first names. <laughs> um, you can say, yeah. You can say you to me. I'm no going to say you to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Oliver, Werner, let's, let's go. <laughs> Werner, if I may start with you, a big company like yours, um, no, it's fine, you can, you can come to us. A big company <laughs> like yours has specific strengths and, and achievements. What especially could other companies learn from Bayer? Uh, I think, um, and quite frankly, the reason why uh, uh, I'm still very, very, uh, uh, let's say, with great enthusiasm with our company is that uh, the one thing that uh, uh, stands out in our company is that uh, uh, people really like to work together. There's an extremely strong sense of belonging. And in particular, when the going gets tougher, and I guess you know what I'm talking about, Uh, our organization stands really together, yeah, which makes life easy in a way because you can focus your energy uh, uh, outward rather than inward. Yeah, I think that's one of the really great things about the company. And then, of course, that constant push for the next better solution and uh, that uh, very strong uh, innovation culture that we do have. 
Oliver, people standing together in, in tough times, uh, in windy times, um, and, and being loyal to the company, is that something that Allianz could learn from Bayer, that you would like to learn from Bayer? <coughs> It depends on who you speak. So Allianz has three core values, basically. <coughs> One is about integrity. When you look at all the financial ca scandals, the tax scandals, Al Allianz was never on the first page, and I hope it stays this way. So that's something that we really cherish. The second one is competence. So when we find out that we are in stuff that we don't understand properly or not a leader, we get out of it and try to be best. And the third one, we are pretty resilient, right? We have uh, had three financial crises the last decade. Um, two of them put us pretty much to the edge, and we came back very strongly. So I think that formed the organization at large. What we have to accept is that uh, Allianz is not a German insurance company with a few international subsidiaries. Um, it is actually a, a, at home in 70 countries. We make a lot more money in other countries than we make at home, and people even in Munich have to understand the world is out there. It's not yet. So that's, I think, what we'll, we'll, what we'll have to learn. So I take it you, you don't want to learn anything from Bayer. Is there something Bayer can learn from, <laughs> yeah. from well, Allianz? You know. For sure, I like to have your stock performance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's going to come. Uh, but uh, uh, no, we, uh, uh, we really admire uh, the, uh, the strength of leadership at Allianz. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, Allianz is a value-driven company and organization and that it has been around forever also as a uh, actually very, very strong partner to our company because uh, we are doing quite a bit of business together. You are our most important insurer. And uh, you know, in times uh, of difficulties, we know who we can rely on. And I think that is very, very important in business. Yeah. I wish, by the way, we could support, this is another very important point, as in the past, German industry much more. Given our regulation, unfortunately, I could not invest as much as I would like to do into his stock, but that's not because we don't want, but because we can't. It's something we need to bear in mind. By the way, two comments, first on the intro. First one, 30% uh, improvement in value was just last year. I've been there five years. <laughs> uh, last year, the value increase was 30. And the other one, the problem was not the, the, uh, the sneakers. The problem was that the sneakers were red because our company col uh, color is blue. <laughs> so people were not uh, forgiving me the red color. Well, that, that makes sense. Um. <laughs> Your, your two companies, you know, obviously very different entities, but if, if one looks at the two of you, there, there are also similarities. You both studied economics and business, even partly at the same university of Cologne, um, and you both, in your very own ways, um, not only CEOs of companies with 100,000 and more people, but um, trying to transform those companies pretty rapidly. Um, and um, the question I have is maybe... Werner, with you first, what is expected um, of a CEO with those goals and, and those tasks today? What, what's your role and how is it different from what it used to be maybe for your predecessors? Well, I guess uh, uh, you're in each generation, uh, regardless where you are uh, uh, in, uh, in a big organization, regard, actually I think also regardless of you know, the level of uh, uh, the, um, the leadership position you have, challenges are different. And uh, you know, all of us, uh, I guess you have done it at uh, Allianz, uh, we have done it uh, uh, at Bayer, have to figure out what is the right thing to do for the company. And uh, uh, once you know, we, uh, we, we came down on what it is that we want to do, uh, it is important to create alignment uh, for a decision to be taken because uh, your decision is worth nothing if you can't implement it. Um, we uh, uh, did that, I think, uh, uh, with you know, some success uh, and you know, some pieces we, are, we still have to show whether we are ultimately going to be successful. But uh, in terms of leadership, uh, it is very much bringing people uh, uh, together, uh, not necessarily, at least as far as I'm concerned, uh, kind of running ahead. I think it's much, much better to form a consensus in a team before we go. Uh, and that has proven to be the right thing, at least for our company uh, so far. It's very, it's very similar. Um, running a very large organization is a little bit like riding an elephant, right? The elephant can decide to throw you off the back, right? So you need to be very careful in terms of how to think about making sure that it's not just alignment, but people are ready to really implement, as he said. And, and the problem is a lot of the incentives of people are not aligned with that. 
So we have a lot of questions around how do we simplify a business. That means a lot of jobs that actually manage complexity will disappear. So finding the right balance, we call it between heritage and keeping the strongs of the past. Alliance will be 130 years old this year. And being strong enough and fast enough to renew is a real challenge. And the age structure in many of our large companies doesn't help. We have a lot of people that are above 45 and older that are very worried about the next 15 years of their career. Will they see it through to the end successfully? And we need to take to the, these concerns very seriously. If I have to admit one thing as a mistake, initially I didn't take enough time to really just not just explain, but actually bred the emotional buy-in to say, you know, regardless of whether that is in your personal interest, we as a company need to do that. Otherwise, we're not going to be around an, uh, another 130 years. Mm -hmm. And that is very important. How honest can you be in these processes? Did you ever lie for your company? Never. You? <laughs> <laughs> no. Fortunately, you know, yeah. my words are out in public. Maybe, uh, maybe not consciously, but uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to your point, I think um, uh, it's a very, very dangerous and easy way to go first, yeah, to sugarcoat things and not be truthful and upfront. And similar to compromise, it will always come back and haunt you, always. And um, I think the better way to go uh, for all people uh, involved is to be straightforward. Uh, and um, what you said I think is also very important. Uh, being straightforward does not mean uh, that uh, you cannot do it with respect, empathy, uh, and, and certainly uh, also with, uh, you know, some people do it better than others, with maybe, maybe a human touch where you, you try to understand where you know, uh, your, 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 your counterpart is at emotionally. Yeah? Uh, I've done it quite a bit, quite frankly, in very, very difficult situations. Um, I used to be the labor director of our company, so that of HR uh, during the, uh, the phase of um, uh, the acquisition of sharing. sharing. And uh, you know, this is very, very difficult if you're sitting or standing in front of, let's say, 20 times this group of people, uh, and you have to say that uh, a lot of jobs are going to be lost because of something that is right for the company, but uh, it feels awfully wrong for the individual. And um, I had uh, a woman stand up who said, well, um, I'm 43 years old of age, I'm a single mother, I have three kids, and I just bought an apartment. And you are telling me that I'm going to lose my job. Very, very difficult situation. Should have told her that she's not good, going to lose her job and ultimately she's going to lose it. Uh, extremely difficult in terms of credibility. But helping people also in terms of, let's say, the financial means, requalification, um, uh, uh, helping people to get into new jobs is, I think, the best we can do. Uh, I think uh, both of our companies are very, very socially responsible. And that is why right now, quite frankly, also in the current situation where we take roughly 10% of our global workforce <coughs> out of active employment in the company, uh, there's a lot of people who are personally affected, but they feel treated with respect. And I think that is, I think from a leadership perspective, the most important thing to do. Oliver, do you remember a, bene a benevolent lie you might have told? Uh, hopefully, hopefully not, because there are no benevolent lies. All right, <laughs> excellent. Right. So what? Uh, and it's very important. No, no. I, I, it's very important. What obviously what you're trying to imply is their intent and non-intent, or do you complete? But it's very difficult to apply. Do you supply all the facts all the time to everybody, so that there's a difference between saying the truth but not the full story versus going out and saying, by the way, I just want to tell you yeah. we are going to do that. The other thing, um, and I want to pick up on what he said, I was also, this is what we have in common, we are both CFO before, but also HR directors, I've did that for three years. We have a big advantage in Germany still that is under leveraged because we have workers' representation on our supervisory board. I can tell you from my work, actually in terms of in, uh, intelligent about go, what goes on in the company, and because we have a European Workers' Council, I get a lot of information that I don't get out of the normal channel. Assuming two things, you have very qualified people, which we have, and that really care for the benefit of the company and not just their own positions. And we in Allianz have been very fortunate to have that make up. I would actually go so far to say without their support, I would have not made it. At this meeting here in Davos and, and also in the management world at large, there is a lot of talk about shifting from shareholder back to stakeholder value these days. There was even 200 leading American CEOs last summer who, who 
signed a declaration saying exactly that. Um, Welcome to soziale Marktwirtschaft. Yeah. 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 They finally well, figured my, it out. My, my question is, does this affect you at all? Are, are you changing too in that regard? It would be very sad if we were to say yes. I think another advantage that we have in Germany and uh, big parts of Europe that we have had that concept for a long, long time. The issue that we have to wrestle with is that what do CEOs say and what do, do investors, and we are big investors, actually do when they make capital allocation decisions. And a lot of the incentives we still have in capital markets are too short-term driven. We just need to say it as you asked for the truth. So there's a lot of people that say in public that write letters and says, you know, here's a letter for you this year. But when it gets to decision making on a quick buck on an M&A transaction exactly. that is hostile, they tender the shares. They do securities lending to support hedge funds. So we, you know, I think the press can play a big role between uh, sort of what they are saying and what they do every day. You know, if the large uh, asset managers of this world supply all the shares through securities lending, uh, for hedge funds and short sellers, then you should ask yourself, didn't you just last year write that you are for sustainable capitalism? How do these two things work together? So there's a lot of storytelling at the moment, particularly in, Anglo -Saxon, in the Anglo-Saxon world. We would like to see a little more implementation action. <laughs> Um, how do you view that? Uh, I guess there's, uh, first of all, I think it's a positive sign that in the uh, Anglo-Saxon world there's a realization that the myopic focus on shareholder value only is not necessarily uh, uh, conducive to real long-term value creation, uh, even though uh, the Anglo-American system has been superior yeah, for, let's say, many, many years or decades. Uh, given where you know, our companies are, uh, we are running co-determined organizations. You mentioned I uh, share your, your perspective 100%. Um, our companies, uh, certainly the, let's say, traditional bigger companies in Germany, uh, have, I think, mostly a much bigger footprint in terms of um, their, um, uh, their uh, how should I call it, their, let's say, their role in the community. Um, our, certainly our company, if I look at uh, beer and what beer stands for, has always wanted to be it's deeply ingrained in our culture. We want to be a good corporate citizen. Yeah? We like to do good things. Uh, we uh, like to care for our people. Uh, the company was founded uh, and then later on trans, uh, uh, you know, uh, moved uh, to a place where there was no infrastructure. It was totally clear that the company was going to build it. And uh, you know, that was 140 years ago. That infrastructure, whether it's sports clubs, uh, whether it is housing, whether it's culture, many, many, many other things are still being supported by the company. Actually, now for a much broader community, it goes way beyond the company. And I think that uh, that is a key element going forward as public trust is actually going down yeah, or has gone down significantly for organizations like ours, uh, that we have a chance yeah, to be part of a community mm -hmm. and then also with that uh, also rebuild yeah, some of the trust that has been lost over the years. You both make it sound like Germany was never affected by the shareholder virus, but if I remember Daimler Chrysler or if I remember... Deutsche Bank under Ackermann, it, it may at least have sort of made its way through the to, to the edges of Germany. Um, we hear we also. But these are very good examples. Uh, uh, if yeah. we have time, we go. We can go through that, not without the companies. The issue is really serious, as you mentioned, because the vast majority of our capital are controlled by foreigners. Because we have zero incentives for German service, uh, savers to invest, whether it's directly or indirectly, in stock companies. We're actually driving them into bank deposits with negative returns. Yep. So it's our own fault that we have Americans running Germany. I so think the, there, there we, we, there, we time on that. there we can agree very quickly. There's also a lot of talk um, about um, to get this issue of the of the table. Um, we also hear a lot about greater purpose these days yeah. uh, when it comes to companies. In one word or one sentence at at the most. What's the purpose of your company? Science for a better life. We call it We Secure Your Future. <laughs> All right. Um, well, was that a personal comment? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, we already do because we uh, run the uh, Deutsche Presse Versorgungswerk. Oh, okay. okay. Some <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. If I had to rely on the Presse Versorgungswerk, ladies and gentlemen, 
I'd be a very poor person. Um, Without us, you would be much poorer. <laughs> um, to interfere in society is something that many people expect of people like you. Um, and there are people in Germany, CEOs in Germany, especially Joe Kaeser of Siemens, who do this, who, who, who speak broadly on political issues, who ask for inclusive capitalism. Um, is, is, is there, to you, is Joe Kaeser a model? Is that something you strive after, or is it an anti-model, something you really don't want to do? Oliver, if you want to start. I think every person has to figure out what their profile is. Uh, I don't want to uh, comment on what Joe does. He has a very exciting and very challenging job. Uh, we have made for us, for our institution, and my, myself, made the decision that we have an opinion on matters that we have competence in. So think about retirement, think about social security, think about health care, but that we venture our opinion in a direct conversation with the political parties, by the way, across the spectrum. But I'm not elected by the people, so have no power, no right to speak on behalf of the electorate. I can only, as an expert, voice an opinion. And I think, you know, criticizing our government doesn't help at all. Actually, it polarizes. But what we do do, we come with facts, we come with experience, and then say, you know, if you'd ask us, this is what we'd recommend. So, and, and we stick to the subject matters that we really think we know something about. Not me having opinion on immigration, and yes, I do as a as a civil servant. But again, I'm not elected for that. But you do, uh, Werner. If I may continue this this line of questioning for a moment, you do have an opinion, and you do have an expert opinion, for example, on climate issues and yes, environmental issues. Um, but at the same time, you don't really speak out on them in you know in a very audible fashion. It's not that. All, for example, uh, 30 German DAX CEOs, leading CEOs, um, bring together an initiative to finally um, sort of get the uh, sort of yeah. the climate train uh, on track. So um, I'm wondering, aren't you underselling both your expertise and your influence? First of all, I agree on everything with everything that that Oliver said. Yeah, uh, that's also my opinion. Uh, if at all, it's policy, but not politics that we comment on to the extent that we are affected by it. And uh, uh, all of us have our own convictions and perspectives, uh, but nothing that anybody will really benefit from, I believe, yeah, uh, if we were to share it also in our roles, because it always comes back and it's going to be linked to the roles we have yeah, uh, if we are too vocal about it. But everybody has to decide on his own what it is yeah, that, uh, that he wants to portray to, uh, to the world. Secondly, um, you know, broader initiatives. Uh, there's a saying in Germany that you know, holds true from time to time. Uh, und wenn ich nicht mehr weiter weiß, dann gründe ich einen Arbeitskreis. Yeah, I don't know what. You, you have English, to try and translate. I'm afraid. English, uh, I don't know what the English translation is. So if I don't know uh, how to figure out myself, yeah, I kind of create a task force. Uh, that is not necessarily uh, the best way to go. I think what's much more important, and uh, with that, I think the stimulus we have gotten with that very much elevated discussion yeah, on uh, you know, saving the world by doing more for the climate and also for the sustainability. I think that has certainly unlocked in our company uh, a realization that uh, we have not stretched ourselves far enough, that we could do much more yeah, if we really try harder. Uh, and that is what has led into uh, uh, you know, the formulation of our sustainability strategy uh, that cuts across a number of different areas that we believe are very important uh, for us to become a systemic part of the solution that we need to actually be in order to hit uh, the SDG uh, objectives by 2030, and then put our money, our efforts, uh, and our energy yeah, uh, where our mouth is. Yeah? That has to be, I think, a very, very integrated system that starts with the formulation of what it is that we are going to do. Secondly, putting in the metrics that we are going to measure with. Third, formulating milestones. And fourth, not to forget, to make sure that our organization is aligned uh, a, that they're in it with their hearts, which is actually not that difficult because a lot of people sign up for the right thing very, very quickly, but B, that they stay on it, and for that to stay on, it means that the incentives have to be aligned yeah, in order to make sure that people continue to do the right thing. Can I press you a little bit more on this? Because I'm not 100% convinced yet um, well, I'll about your 
about sort of the use of your influence and power mm. um, because um, on one hand you're very ready to, to to take a lot of risk to take on a lot of resistance I mean Werner you for example you bought probably the one of the most risky companies on the planet um, and you you you're driving your your digital change and simplification process um, very hard um, but when it comes to these sort of overarching questions, namely climate change as the most pressing one, um, then this courage seems to to not um, take hold anymore. Then then it's all way more careful and confined to your to sort of what you what you can do at the moment. Um, isn't sort can of I, can I disagree yeah, actually here in Davos? Okay, so my last day. I think Alliance you, you with have a company to. with uh, 17 other companies, CalPERS, we have the world represented the Japanese. We founded the Net Zero Asset Alliance, which means the asset owners, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, insurers, not asset managers that have a mandate, have committed already in September 2.4 trillion dollars to go to net zero by 50. Nothing happened before. We're the only group that has a target, a real target that is hardwired, will be hardwired in our centers and will be hardwired. We were the first company to exit coal investments and to exit, by the way, people standing in front of my house in Cologne are not being happy about it. So uh, it's not that we're not doing it. It's going to be, by the end of this week, at least four trillion, which is, by the way, the size of the German economy. In six months, we've gotten investors to commit to exit the portfolios, and the companies that we invested will feel it very soon. So in the area, because we are one of the largest institutional investors in Europe, so we can make change happen, and we do do that. And we are also commenting to our government of what makes sense and makes no sense. So we get all this, you know, going after <laughs> car drivers and after the car industries where we have millions of lorries running across Europe making much more of a mess of our environment that nobody talks about. When the ship goes down the Elbe, it makes 100,000 cars uh, equivalent in terms of dirt into the air. Nobody talks about that. Nobody addresses that. We let ourselves be known. And we need to get to some science into that. So on climate change, I can agree with many other things. By the way, I agree also that we can do a better job in, in having the, the 30 largest uh, companies to have one voice. We, we used to be much better. By the way, when we did that, we were very heavily criticized for being the Deutschland AG. Sure, you have, to, you have to live Germany. with criticism, yeah. Yeah, we can do that very, uh, we can do that. But I, what I'm trying to say on climate change, I think German companies are actually at the forefront. Now we have many other areas, digitalization you just mentioned. I just think about the following number. 50% of households in France have a cable connection. Now, glass faser in German. In Germany, it's five. It's totally embarrassing. We've known it for 10 years. It's written up in the press, and nothing happens. You know, how many times do I need to repeat that? And we can do it as 30 ducks. We can sing a choir. <laughs> it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything. The only thing that happens is that we become the objective of other people's ear. I think people need, when the next time they go and elect, say, you know, what is the government doing practically, and then vote. That's what they are doing. And we are trying to make practical proposals where we have influence. And climate change, I'm doing it every day. Um, but there we go again, because of, you know, you talked about climate change, and then you go to digitization, yeah. and off, off topic you are, uh, because it, um, there are all these other things that also have to be yeah. taken care of. Maybe but is climate change really just one of the topics? So uh, maybe you go back onto the topic, and uh, uh, the first question I would have is, what is missing that the alliance <laughs> of the 30 DAX companies would do some good on. Yeah, the way, uh, maybe, maybe with, let's say, some limitations, we have been looking at it, is that uh, um, we have something that uh, I think people can um, relate to and sign up for, because it's been very, very broadly communicated, uh, and there's a very, very solid following and support. These are the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them. What we did when we looked at uh, what it is that we can do in terms of uh, contributing from our end uh, towards a more sustainable world is that we looked at those goals rather than thinking up something new that would actually contribute to the confusion whether we do it as a company or whether we do it in the alliance of uh, you know, the 30 biggest companies in Germany. Uh, but we went back a more simplistic way and said, well, these are actually very, very good objectives. They are backed 
by a very recognized and renowned organization. So nobody is going to come and tell us yeah, that uh, this is self-serving the way we, are, we kind of formulated them, uh, then how we set the targets and so on. And we are now looking at the right measures that also have to be transferable, they have to be trackable, they have to be auditable so that we can transparently measure progress towards the things that we have signed up for. And we have signed up for, as a company, to be climate neutral within the frame of the goals that were set by 2030. We have also signed up for a number of other objectives that we are going to get accomplished by 2030 that will contribute to reaching a number, actually three or four, of the sustainability goals. We have also signed up for creating a much bigger impact than what we can do on our own, which is kind of, let's say, the basics, yeah, that we become climate neutral. We need to do much more in order to create a bigger impact on climate neutrality, in particular in agriculture, when it comes to driving down the carbon footprint of agriculture. And we have signed up for a 30% reduction in that space as well with the products and the solutions that we can contribute over the next 10 years. I think it wouldn't get any better if we were to have that discussion within your, the group of the Dutch CEOs. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for that, but I can't see the point. I, I don't want to bring in Greta and I, I don't want to bring in Luisa, but um, I have a 14-year-old environmentally conscious daughter um, who is way smarter than I am. And um, she, she would say um, to what you both say, maybe you are further advanced than the rest of the, some of the world. American, Americans at, uh, at least. But are you serious? 2050? You have to do this way, way earlier because if you only stop this investing by 2050, uh, we're not going to be climate neutral on this planet yeah, but in the that's, same that's year. the end of the journey, not the beginning. So a lot of things will happen for you. But to your daughter, I also have two kids, 19 and 20, I get the same speech. <laughs> and, and, they, and they are correct, and they are correct, because the world is run by people over 50, uh, mostly men, that basically subconsciously think we're going to be long dead when the effects of all this nonsense will come in. And they are correct. So we need to be much, much faster. But at the same time, this is not about religion. It is about facts and what we can do tomorrow. And by the way, there's a lot more that we can do a lot faster. So for example, we were together as the asset owners with the oil and gas industry today. We've told in 15%, I'm done in a second, 15% of the CO2 emissions are created as we extract oil and gas out of this earth. It's mostly methane, by the way. And they can be addressed tomorrow. We don't need to wait 10 years. It can be done tomorrow, and it has to happen tomorrow. Last question to the both of you. One sentence as an answer, please. Um, Ven, if I may start with you. You both don't want to get involved into politics, but there is, if there is one governmental measure that you would hit the streets for, what would it be? Uh, I would actually uh, happily contribute a lot of money to campaign yeah, that straightens some of our politicians out yeah, to talk about the truth yeah, and actually drive more science and fact-based decisions rather than overly politicized decisions. I think that would make a big difference uh, in the political arena. Oliver? I think I'm very much aware of that. Sorry. I'm supposed to not say much anymore. No, no, no. just one sentence. <laughs> one, one, sentence is one sentence. I go to the streets for what my kids also go to the streets for, making sure that we leave the planet in a better place than I inherited from my predecessor. Excellent. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, This, um, this conversation turned out a little more serious than I had anticipated. Um, and um, I thank both of you to, to stick with it, stick with me, and uh, enduring me calling you by your first names. Thank you very much, everybody. This is over because we have to leave uh, the house. Thank you very much to, um, to the organizers. And um, thank you very much for all of you to not only come, but to stay. Thank you very much.